To watch these important lessons, subscribe to DP Education's YouTube channel right now. Click on the bell icon to stay updated on the latest lessons. Sri Lanka's largest free online school, DP Education. Hello, my dear students. Today also, I'm going to discuss with you all the GCE O-Level 2020 paper. I started off the paper one in the previous chapter. So we discussed the first 15 questions there. Now I'm going to start from the 16th question. So here, question number 16, a person's glucose level in the blood has increased above the optimum level. Uh, so in a healthy person, it should be between 80 milligram and 100 and 120 milligram per 100 milliliters of blood. So that is how we observe the amount of glucose. So if it is less also not good, if it is too much also not good. So there, there will be homeostasis and the sugar level has to be regulated. But if you look at the question here, which of the following food items should be should he consume minimally? Now this is related to a person who has a slightly higher blood glucose level. So that will be more than 120. So the person has to reduce eating a certain food. So any food item that contains glucose in it or that can digest and form glucose as the end product. You all know students, glucose is a monosaccharide. It's a carbohydrate, a monosaccharide. The constituent substance, the structural con component of the disaccharides as well as polysaccharides is again the monosaccharides. So glucose is usually the structural component of all the polysaccharides. So any food that contains glucose or that can give glucose on digestion should, don't, should be avoided by the person. Now if we look at the food items given here. Now meat, what is meat? Meat usually contains proteins and if it is white meat, less amount of lipids. If it is red meat, the amount of lipids is also high. So usually proteins and lipids are there, fats are there in meat as well. Then if you take milk, milk usually has carbohydrate, the disaccharide lactose or monosaccharide galactose. But that doesn't directly increase the glucose level because even lactose has galactose and glucose but the amount of glucose there is somewhat less. Then if you take green gram that is moong or pyre, what is that? That mainly contains proteins. Green grams they mainly contain proteins. Then bread, bread is starch. Now you all know starch is a polysaccharide and starch is made up of glucose units. It is a natural polymer of many glucose units. So when starch is hydrolyzed by amylase, there is maltose produced. Maltose undergoes hydrolysis and gives rise to glucose. So that can directly increase the glucose level in the person. So he has to avoid bread. A person's glucose level in the blood has increased above the optimum level that is between this range. Which of the following food items should he consume minimally? It should be bread because starch that hydrolyzes to give glucose as the end products. Is that clear student? So then we'll move on to the next one. Question number 17. Select the false statement about nucleic acids. False statement. Look at the statements. Building unit is called nucleotide. Second one, a natural polymer. Third one, store hereditary information. And fourth one, contain the element CHO and N. Now, before I answer the questions, we'll look at the structure of nucleic acids. Now, here I have given the DNA molecule. You all know DNA in addition to that, there is RNA. Now, in nucleic acids, there is carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen and phosphorus. 
Now carbon, hydrogen, oxygen combine, they form the pentose sugar group. You all know either it can be deoxyribose sugar or ribose sugar depending on whether it's DNA or RNA. So this is a 5 carbon that is pentose sugar. Then in a nitrogenous base there is nitrogen. Then there is the phosphate group. When we say phosphate PO4 3 minus normally that is the phosphate ion. So this is a phosphate group. So there is phosphate also. Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus. So when I say nitrogenous base, it contains nitrogen in addition to other elements. Same way phosphate also, phosphorus is present. So all these elements are present in nucleic acid. Then you all can remember when a phosphate group, pentose sugar and nitrogenous base combine together, we get the nucleotide. All these three together is known as the nucleotide. So you have the constituent elements and the three components that is phosphate, pentose sugar and nitrogenous base combine and form the nucleotide. Nucleotides combine and form the nucleotide chain or the polynucleotide chain. So it is a natural polymer because when these combine it forms the polynucleotide tide chain. So here you can see this one blue color strand is a polynucleotide chain. The red color strand is another polynucleotide chain. DNA is made of two such chains arranged in an alpha helix manner, a double helical structure. Whereas RNA is just one strand of polynucleotide chain. That is what we call as nucleic acid. So since it is a polynucleotide chain, it is a natural polymer. Is that clear students? So here of course you can see these are the hydrogen bonds between the nitrogen base pairs that is present in a DNA molecule. That is also shown here. So now if we look at the answers. Here you can see select the false statement. You need to select the false statement. Building unit is called nucleotide. That is correct. We saw that. It is a natural poly polymer. Yes. It stores hereditary information. That is also correct. DNA stores hereditary information. Contain the element C, H, O and N. That is false. Because there is phosphorus also. There is the phosphate group. So phosphorus is also there as a element. So that is the false statement. Select the false statement above nucleic acids contain the element C, H, O and N. Is that clear student? So then we will move on to the next question. That is question 18. Examples for the seeds or fruits dispersed by water, wind and explosive mechanism respectively are. So you all know students, when they are being dispersed, why do the seeds or fruits need to get dispersed? Because they need to find a new environment where they can reduce competition. There can be evolution. They can get adapted to a new environment. So for all those purposes, mainly to reduce competition. Now if they fall under the mother plant, then they all live in a certain area. So then of course there is competition for food, water, light, even soil space. There is so much of competition. To avoid that they get dispersed. And when they go to a new environment, they find a new environment. At the same time biodiversity of different environments increase. So for all those purposes, there is the dispersal of seeds and fruits. And there are different medium that facilitate this dispersal of seeds and fruits. So water, wind and explosive mechanism in addition to that there is the dispersal by animals. Now here of course we need to find the examples for water, wind and explosive mechanism. So what I have done is I have put the pictures of all these uh, 
fruits and seeds in the next slide. With that, I will discuss the answer with you all. So here you can see Ceylon almond, Kottamba or Khatapu. Then there is Hora and Mango. Lotus, Castor, that is Enderu or Amanak and Rubber. Then Coconut, Milkweed, that is Vara or Erkalai and Rubber. Then Jack, Cotton and Okra, that's Bandaka or Wendy. So those are the answers. We will look at them in the next slide. Now here I have put the pictures. Now you can see Ceylon Almond. Normally it has a thick skin. Then inside it has a fiber-like structure and a very strong coated sea. Because you all know they are dispersed by water. Now the first one, this is by water. This is by water. Then horror, you can see these wing-like structures. From the adaptation that they show, you can easily identify how they are dispersed. Now this you can see the wing-like structures. Then you know it has to be by what? Wind. This is wind. This is water. Then here, mango of course a fleshy edible part. It has a nice fragrance. So that is by animals. That's easy to remember. So Ceylon almond by water, then horror by wind and mango by animals. Then the next set of answers, lotus. Lotus again you can see this spongy structure. Can you remember? So that it can float easily on water. A spongy structure that contains the seed with air pores and all that so that it can float. So that is again by water. This one, lotus. Castor. Now look at the outer covering of the fruit. It has like spine-like structures or hook-like structures that can attach itself to the body of an animal. Then it can easily be dispersed. So this is by animals, castor. You can see the fruits there. Then rubber you can see it has burst and the seeds are dispersed. So it is either by explosion or wind because even if it explodes, explosive mechanism, it has to be taken, carried with the wind. So here again explosive mechanism, save explosive or wind. So both mechanism, both, both methods of dispersal. Then look at the third one. Now again coconut. Coconut, you can see the coconut floating similar to Ceylon almond. You can remember there is a very thick skin so that water doesn't go in. Then we have the coconut husk, the fibers with lot of air pores in it. So the coconut seed becomes light. Inside that there is the very thick strong shell so that the water doesn't go in and there is the endocarp that stores the food and the embryo all that is there. So coconut again dispersed by water. Then here you can see from the picture itself you can see the calotrop is very tiny seeds very light and the calotropis has burst out and the seeds are being dispersed and they have hair-like structures. So this is again Calotropis, another name Vara or Erkalai or Milkweed. All the different languages, the names. So here you can see this is either by wind or explosive mechanism. So here I'll write wind or explosive mechanism. Then rubber again you can see like I told you all explosive mechanism or Wait, so both are rubber explosive mechanism or B. Then the last one, jackfruit, you can see the edible part, very tasty fruit, the edible part. So that has to be by animals. Usually if it is being dispersed by animals, they have the succulent edible parts, a nice fragrance. So that animals are attracted to that and they eat it and put the seed away. So this is again by animals. Then cotton here you can see explosion, explosive mechanism and with wind. Usually whenever you have explosive mechanism there is wind also because again here you will see they are very light tiny seeds. So wind 
or explosive mechanism. So the cotton wool is here. Then the tiny seeds you would have seen dark brown or black color tiny seeds. They just flow with the wind. So cotton is by wind or explosive. How about okra? Okra means bandaka or vendi. What is that? Here you can see the dried fruit. Inside there are the seeds. When the water is being absorbed, the seed become the fruit becomes very dry. It just opens up again. Explosive mechanism. So then the seed spread by wind. So that is also wind or explosive mechanism. So you have looked at all the combinations. Now you know. Ceylon almond by water, horror by wind, mango animals, again lotus water, castor fruit animal, rubber by wind or explosive mechanism. Here this is, we don't say explosive mechanism because that itself is the fruit. Here it has to explode, the seed has to come up. Then water, coconut, calotrop is again wind or explosive mechanism, rubber, wind or explosive mechanism. And finally we have Jackfruit, animal, cotton, wind or explosive mechanism and okra also wind or explosive mechanism. So you all know how you can identify the different methods by which seeds and fruits are dispersed. They have specific adaptations. So if you can remember the seed or fruit, immediately you can relate it to the adaptation. Then you can understand what the mode of dispersal is. Now if we look at the answers, seeds and fruits dispersed by water, wind and explosive mechanism. Ceylon almond, water, horror by wind and mango, animal, no. Then lotus, water, castor, animal, rubber, explosive mechanism, but not the correct combination. Then third one, coconut, yes, water, milkweed, that is varao irukale, again by wind, and rubber, again by explosive mechanism. So here also there is explosion, explosive mechanism, but mainly with the wind, because I told you all it has that hair-like structure, that is milkweed. So the third answer is the correct combination. So here the fourth answer, jack, cotton and okra, so jack is dispersed by animals. Cotton, yes, it is by wind. Okra is by explosive mechanism. But to give the correct order, water, wind and explosive mechanism, it is the third combination. So coconut, milk, weed, that is vara or irukale and rubber. So that gives the correct order. Coconut by water, milk, weed, weed by wind, and then rubber by explosive mechanism. Is that clear student? So with that, I'll move on to the next question. This is question 19. Which of the following does not pass into the fetus from the mother through the umbilical cord? So just to understand the development of fetus in the uterus, I have put this diagram here. So here we call it the water bag where you have the embryonic membranes and there is embryonic fluid inside it so that the fetus is protected by from shock and vibrations and all that and also desiccation. And then you can see this part is the placenta that is where the umbilical cord or the actually the embryonic sac is attached to the uterus of the mother. So that is where we have the placenta and placenta is like a barrier. It allows certain substances to go into the fetus through the umbilical cord. Here you can see the umbilical cord there and substances to come from the fetus to the mother. But you can remember placenta never allows the blood to mix. Mother's blood does not mix, mix with the fetus's blood. Now nutrients, gases, even medicines, pathogens, all these can go from the mother to the fetus. At the same time, the excretory material from the fetus comes to the mother. All that happens through the 
umbilical cord. And placenta is like the barrier that doesn't allow certain substances to go from the mother to the fetus or fetus to the mother. Mainly the blood of the mother and the fetus never mixes. So here the diagram you can see the fetus is here then the uterine wall from that only you can see the embryonic membrane and here where the embryonic membrane is connected to the uterine wall you get the placenta from the placenta only you get the umbilical cord and then here the cervix the bladder is shown the vagina through this only the fetus has to come out and also you can see the anus there. So if we go back to the question which of the following does not pass into the fetus from the mother through the umbilical cord. So blood never passes. Nutrients yes. Oxygen from the mother to the fetus so that the fetus can breathe inhale and pathogens also yes they do go from the mother to the fetus. That is why if the mother is affected by certain diseases when she is carrying the fetus in her womb then the fetus can be affected by it. So that also goes. So which of the following does not pass? Does not pass it is blood. Nutrients, oxygen, pathogens all of them pass. Is that clear student? So then I'll move on to the next question. Question number 20. What is the ray diagram which illustrates the phenomenon of total internal reflection? Now here you can see there are four answers given all are different diagrams. There are the two media, glass and air and how the rays undergo refraction or total internal reflection. To understand that first I'll move on to the next slide where I discuss this concept. Now here you all can remember students when light travels from one medium to another medium the density of the media are different because of that the speed of light varies from one medium to the other. If the speed of light is faster we call it the rare medium. If the speed of light is slower we call it the denser medium. Now if you take these two medium, here I have used water and air. So water is denser, air is rarer medium. Because speed of light is less in water, speed of light is more in air. So air is the rare medium. Is that clear student? So when light goes from one medium to the other, here you can see in this first diagram, what happens? This is the angle of incidence. Light ray goes and meets at the interface. That is the, this is the normal. So you can see angle of incidence. Then the light ray refracts away from the normal. Here you can see this is the angle of refraction. So light ray refracts away from the normal when it goes from a denser medium to a rare medium. So this is rare, this is dense. Then if you increase the angle of incidence, what will happen? The angle of refraction also increases. Now this concept where the path of the light changes when it travels from one medium to the other only, we call it as refraction. So here it is refraction. Now look at the second diagram. When you keep on increasing the angle of incidence at one point the angle of refraction becomes 90 degrees. Angle of refraction is 90 degrees that is when the light ray travels along the interface of the two media. At this point we call the angle of incidence as critical angle. Is that clear? So initially there is refraction. There the when the light ray goes from the dense medium to the rare medium the refracted ray moves away from the normal. But when you keep on increasing the angle of incidence the angle of refraction increases and when the there is a point where the angle of refraction 
is 90 degrees. That is the refracted ray goes through the interface. The angle of incidence is known as the critical angle. In an instance, if the angle of incidence is greater than the critical angle. So here you can see I is greater than the critical angle. Then of course there will be no refraction. Instead there is reflection within the same medium. So that is known as total internal reflection. Now here also the angle of incidence is equal to angle of reflection. Here it is reflection. This R is angle of reflection. Is that clear? Here there is refraction. Here also there is refraction. Here there is total internal reflection. And during total internal reflection also they are the angles are equal according to the normal rules of laws of reflection. I should be equal to R. Angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. And the normal incident ray and the reflected ray, they all lie on the same plane. So that is total internal reflection. Is that clear? And always the total internal reflection occurs in the denser medium not in the rare medium, in the denser medium. Is that clear? So then, now we will look at the question. Here you can see, what is the ray diagram which illustrates the phenomenon of total internal reflection? Total internal reflection, here look at this one, glass, dense, air, rare medium, that you know. Light is faster through air, slower through glass. Then here you can see this is the incident ray. There is reflection, reflected ray, theta, theta, both the angle of incidence and the angle of reflection are equal. And this happens in the glass medium that is the denser medium. So this diagram shows total internal reflection. That is correct. Look at the second one. Here also glass is dense, air is rare, that is okay. Here they have shown reflection, incident angle, incident ray, reflected ray. But what do you see here? This is theta, this is alpha. That means the two angles are not equal, they are different. Can that be? No. According to the laws of reflection, Angle of incidence should be equal to angle of reflection. So since this part are not equal, that is not correct according to total internal reflection. The diagram is not correct for total internal reflection. Here what do we see? Again glass and air. Here you see the critical angle but there is still refraction because the angle of refraction is 90 degrees here like we saw before and this is the critical angle. So this is also not total internal reflection. What do you see here? You can see the ray going and being incident on the interface. Theta is the angle of incidence. Here the beta is the angle of refraction. But as you can see here students, the theta is greater than angle beta, this one. That is angle of incidence is greater than angle of refraction. Is that correct? No. Why? Glass is a denser medium. Air is a rare medium. So it has to refract away from the normal. So because of that, this is also incorrect. This is incorrect because of the angles. Here also it is incorrect because of the angles. This shows refraction and only this shows total internal reflection. So this is the correct answer. The phenomenon of total internal reflection. Is that clear student? So with that I will move on to the next question. Question number 21. An athlete finishing a running event suffered from a cramp in his leg. What is the chemical compound which is produced in muscle cells causing the cramp? 
Now you all know this is related to respiration. Now you are familiar with cellular. You are familiar with cellular respiration. Now cellular respiration. What happens there, students? In cellular respiration, glucose undergoes oxidation, producing. So this is the equation there. You have glucose plus oxygen giving rise to carbon dioxide, dioxide, water and energy is released. This is the energy that is needed for the functioning of cells, tissues, all that. So when the athlete is running, then he needs a lot of energy. So there should be a lot of cellular respiration taking place to provide energy. Now this normal cellular respiration here you can see happens in the presence of oxygen. So what do we call that? That is known as aerobic respiration. Aerobic respiration. Now if there is not enough oxygen or in without oxygen, if there is respiration taking place, then that is known as anaerobic respiration. And anaerobic respirations occur differently in plants as well as animals. So if we consider the anaerobic respiration taking place in plants, anaerobic respiration in plants, in plants. What happens there? You have glucose, there is no oxygen, that is why anaerobic respiration. What are the products? We get carbon dioxide, oxide, you get ethyl alcohol and there is energy. But the energy produced here is less than the energy produced during aerobic respiration. And here, because there is ethyl alcohol being produced, we call it alcohol fermentation. This is known as alcohol fermentation. Fermentation. Alcohol fermentation. Is that okay, students? Alcohol fermentation. Now, if you look at the aerobic respiration in a human muscle or human body, in animals, so there anaerobic respiration, respiration, respiration in humans or human cells. There are what happens. Again, glucose, no oxygen we get lactic acid and energy. Only two products. So this is known as lactic acid fermentation. Lactic acid fermentation. So anaerobic respiration is known as fermentation also. In plants, it's alcohol fermentation. In animals or human body, it is lactic acid fermentation. Now, this lactic acid is the one that causes the cramps. When the lactic acid accumulates in muscle cells, it leads to a cramp. Now, when an athlete is running, he needs a lot of energy. So, a lot of cellular respiration happening. At the same time, there may be not enough oxygen intake. So not enough oxygen in the muscle cells of the legs. So because of that there will be anaerobic respiration that is lactic acid fermentation. The lactic acid that is produced it accumulates in the muscles and that causes the cramps. That is why normally you warm up so that you tend to inhale more oxygen and you can prevent the occurrence of cramps. Is that clear, students? So then, if we look at the answers given there, 
and see what is the chemical compound which is produced in muscle cells causing the cramp carbon dioxide in normal respiration and alcohol fermentation ethyl alcohol alcohol fermentation in plants lactic acid that is the compound in human cells and acetic acid acetic acid of course it is a component of vinegar it is not produced during cellular respiration so the answer is lactic acid is that clear student so then i'll move on to the next one 22 a warm blooded that is homeothermic animal and a cold blooded that is poikilothermic animal respectively are now you all know students only mammals mammals and birds that is aves or ave aves those two are the warm blooded animals the two groups of vertebrates that are warm blooded are mammals and birds what is the meaning of warm blooded their body temperature does not change according to the environment temperature so our body has a fixed temperature we are warm blooded animals mammals and birds are warm blooded animals other than that fishes or fishes amphibians reptilia that is the reptiles they are all cold blooded animals or poikilothermic animals so pieces amphibians reptiles they are all cold blooded or poikilothermic animals aves or birds and mammals are the warm blooded animals or homeothermic animals so when you are looking at the answers you have to find their type the group to which they belong to if you look at the first one pigeon is a bird and frog is an amphibian so bird is warm blooded frog amphibian is cold blooded so that is correct then the second one bear is a mammal rat is also a mammal so both are warm blooded rat snake rat snake is a type of snake snake is a reptile reptiles without legs are snakes so that is cold blooded whereas whale is a mammal that is warm blooded so it's in the other order then crocodile again reptile tortoise also it's a reptile so both of them are cold blooded so the correct answer where you have a warm blooded animal and a cold blooded animal it's the first one pigeon and frog is that okay student so look at the combination identify to which vertebrate group they belong to and then you know whether they are warm blooded or cold blooded so with that i'll move on to the next one question 23 which arrangement can be used to obtain a voltage of 3 volt from two dry cells each with an electromotive force of 1.5 volts now you all know when we have a battery with 1.5 volts if you connect another battery if you connect another battery that also has 1.5 volts if they are connected in this correct manner positive negative positive negative then the potential difference adds up and will give you the total 3 volts so you have to make sure that the terminals are connected alternately plus minus plus minus or minus plus minus plus that order so that the potential difference adds up now if you look at the diagram the first one here what do you see if we draw the diagram for the first one you can see there the negative terminal positive terminal negative positive terminal and they are connected like that can you see and from here only we draw the potential now these are one thing parallel connections and also you can see here the negative and negative positive and positive so then it's not the correct connection you will not get three volts now the same thing if you look at for the second one 
Second one also, here you can see positive, negative, positive, negative. Their connection is correct. But what happens is, the potential is drawn from here. The positive is connected to this negative. This positive is connected to this negative. Here it has to be alternate connection. So something similar to this, but the terminals are connected properly. So, second answer you can see, it's connected this way. Negative, positive, positive, negative. But from here only, they are drawing the potential difference. So, they are also, you won't get the proper, this is negative, positive, positive, negative. But when you draw it from here, it's not possible. It's not possible to get 3 volts. Now look at the third answer. Third one. Third one of course is correct. Now here you can see positive terminal, negative terminal, positive terminal, negative terminal. That is the same as this one. Third answer. Is that clear? You all can see negative, positive, negative, positive. The Connection goes this way and you are drawing current from here and here. Similar to this, you are drawing current from these two ends. So that is correct. Look at the fourth one. There also there is a problem. Look at the fourth one. How is that connected? First we have the negative terminal. Then we have the positive terminal. This positive is connected to the positive terminal. It's like this, negative, positive, positive, negative. Here you can see negative, positive, positive, negative. So that is also not correct. So this is the one that gives you three volts. All the other connections, either the terminals, the similar terminals are connected together. Here, although they are alternately connected, but two batteries are connected from both terminals, then also you won't get the proper potential difference. You need to have them connected series manner, in a serial manner and also the alternating terminals, positive, negative, positive, negative, like that. Then only the potential will add up and you will get the required output. Is that clear? So here, the correct connection is the third answer. That is the answer. Which arrangement can be used to obtain a voltage of 3 volt from two dry cells which, with an electromotive force of 1.5 volts? That the third, third answer, I'll mark it with a different color. So this is the answer there. Is that okay, student? The third method of connection. So with that, I'll move on to the next question. 24. What is the metal that reacts with hot water but not with cold water? Now you can remember students, the reactivity of metals. If we take sodium, even with cold water, it is a very vigorous re reaction. Vigorous reaction. Reaction. So like I told you all students, Sodium with cold water itself, it is a very vigorous reaction. You all know hydrogen is evolved and sodium hydroxide is produced. Then if you take magnesium with cold water, there is no reaction. You can remember that. Magnesium doesn't react with cold water. But magnesium with hot water, yes, there is reaction. Not very vigorous, but it does react and form. It forms magnesium hydroxide and hydrogen gas yes, that you can remember. If you react magnesium with steam, then also there is reaction. There is magnesium oxide formed, evolving hydrogen gas. Yes. Now here students, I am not writing equations. I am just giving you all the information. Sodium with cold water, very fast, very vigorous or violent reaction. Magnesium with cold water, no reaction. Magnesium with hot water, yes. With steam also, yes. 
How about aluminium and zinc? You all can remember. Now aluminium, zinc, they also no reaction with both cold and hot water. Hot water. But they react with steam. React with steam. You can remember that. React with steam. So those are some of the reactions that you are familiar with. Now using this information if we look at the answers given to us. What is the metal that reacts with hot water but not with cold water? Sodium reacts with cold water. Magnesium, yes. Doesn't react with cold water, reacts with hot water. Aluminium doesn't react with hot or cold water. Calcium, calcium again reacts with cold water as well as hot water. Calcium, calcium reacts with cold and hot water. Or we can say plus cold water there is reaction reaction so similar to sodium calcium also reacts with cold water so the answer for this question is magnesium reacts with hot water but not react with cold water is that clear student so then i'll move on to the next question so question number 25 what is the correct statement about the COVID-19 virus? So, you all know COVID-19 virus causes corona. That is the disease caused by COVID-19 virus. So, here they want you to find the correct statement about the virus. So, to understand that, I have put the diagram of a virus, structure of a virus as a model observed through the electron microscope. So, you all know students, although virus comes under microorganism, you cannot observe it by the naked eye and also you cannot observe it using a light microscope. You have to use an electron microscope. So, here it has to be an electron microscope. Then if you look at the structure, it has different structures and shapes, viruses. But if you just look at the structure, you can see here there is a protein capsid. That is like an outer cover. Inside the protein capsid, you have a nucleic acid that is either DNA or it can be an RNA. There can't be both. Both DNA and RNA cannot be there. It can be either DNA or RNA only. One of the two will be there. Then you have the tail and the tail fibers that is the structure. So, this is not an organized cellular structure. There is no cell structure. This is a microorganism. Why does it come under microorganism? Because it can be observed only through the electron microscope and also it causes diseases. It acts as a pathogen. Apart from that, it does not show any cellular activities, no metabolic activities. It doesn't do respiration or excretion or none of the normal metabolic activities are carried out by viruses. Only two living characteristics are one thing it replicates in a host cell. When the virus is inside a living cell, a host cell, it can replicate and also it causes a disease. Those are the two living characteristics. Other than that, it doesn't show any other metabolic activities. I'm sure you all can remember that. So then, if we look at the answers, it can be observed by the optical microscope? No, it can only be observed by the electron microscope. Carries out metabolic activities? No. Bears a nucleus with DNA, that is also wrong. There is no Nucleus, only the protein capsid containing a DNA. Shows living as well as non-living characteristics. That is correct. Viruses, they show living and non-living characteristics. So, although they have related it to COVID-19, only thing is it will have DNA, no RNA, but normally viruses can have a DNA or RNA. 
The correct statement here is shows living as well as non-living characteristics. Is that clear student? So with that I will move on to the next question. Here 26. When salt is extracted from seawater in a salt urn, what is the compound that precipitates along with sodium chloride? Now you can remember students, in the salt urn when salt is extracted from seawater, initially you have seawater, then you have three types of tanks. The three types of tanks the broad shallow tank, then you have the medium tank and then the uh, small tanks. Initially we have seawater. Let's say the concentration of seawater, I will take it as C. We pass it into the first tank where the concentration becomes two times the concentration. It is increased by two times. Then there is the calcium carbonate that precipitates in the first tank. Then from there, the seawater is passed to the second tank where the concentration becomes four times the initial concentration. Then you all know it is calcium sulfate that precipitates in the second tank. Then from there, we transfer that seawater into the third tank where the concentration becomes ten times the initial concentration then only sodium chloride precipitates. But while sodium chloride is precipitating, again the concentration increases a little bit more. At the same time, in addition to sodium chloride, there are two more salts that are precipitating there. That is magnesium chloride and magnesium sulfate. Now these two are impurities. You all know the normal sodium chloride has the salt taste. It is the table salt. But this magnesium chloride and magnesium sulfate, they have a bitter taste. And also, sodium chloride is not hygroscopic. It is not hygroscopic. That means it doesn't absorb water from the atmosphere. But these two salts, magnesium chloride and magnesium sulfate, when they absorb moisture from the environment, they become water. That is what is known as hygroscopic nature. So because of those two properties, they need to be removed from sodium chloride. But that only normally salt is heaped for about six months and it is allowed to expose to air and with air. These two, magnesium chloride and magnesium sulfate, dissolve with moisture in air and they evaporate off. So you will get the PO sodium chloride crystals. So that is how the precipitation occurs. So here you all know calcium carbonate has the lowest solubility, least solubility. That is why it precipitates when the concentration is two times. Then calcium sulfate when the concentration is four times and then sodium chloride has the highest solubility among these three. So that precipitates at the concentration ten times more than the initial concentration. So that is the process taking place there. After that what you get after the precipitation of sodium chloride is what we call as bittern or mother liquor that also have contains more ions and those ions also can be separated from the mother liquor. So here the question is when salt is extracted from seawater in a salt and here you all know there is vaporization and crystallization taking place during this process salt. What is the compound that precipitates along with sodium chloride? It's either magnesium chloride or magnesium sulfate. If you look at the answer, sodium sulfate, no. Magnesium chloride, yes. Calcium carbonate in the first tank. Calcium sulfate in the second tank. So the answer is magnesium chloride. Is that clear, student? So with that, I'll move on to the next question. Question number 27. The maximum upthrust exerted by water on a certain object is less than the weight of the object. Upthrust is less than the weight of the object. Then the object will float on the water surface 
float partly immersed in water, float fully immersed in water, sink fully in water. So to understand that, I'll move on to the next slide. Here I have put a diagram. Now in all these, you can see these three. The first three, the objects are floating. Here, of course, it is floating on the surface of water. Here also, let's say the weight x, the weight of the object is downwards. I will put it as 1 and the up thrust is upwards, up thrust 1. Now here, up thrust 1 is equal to weight 1. Then only there is equilibrium, it floats on water. The same way, now if you take the second instance, now here also, there is weight W2 and up thrust U2. Here also up thrust is equal to weight. Then only it can float. When the object is floating, that means the weight is equal to up thrust. Is that clear? Otherwise, it will either move up or move down. In the third instance also, here also if you take, you can see, the weight is down, up thrust is up, right? So they are also up thrust is equal to weight. But the only thing is, now you all know, if you have a light leaf, that will float on top of water. Let's say a wooden block partially submerged in water. Then there can be a slightly heavier object that is completely submerged but still floating in water. Now, in all three instances, when they float in water, always the up thrust is equal to weight. Whether they are completely on the surface, partially submerged or completely submerged, still the up thrust is equal to the weight of the object. Only thing is, if you compare the weight of the objects, the weight of object 1 will be the least value. That will be less than both W2 and W3. So W1 is the lightest object, then W2 a little heavier, W3 will be more heavier. So because of that, up thrust also will be in this manner. Up thrust 3 will be the largest value because the weight is more, up thrust is more, but W3 equals U3. In this instance, because the weight is less, the up thrust is also less. But in all three instances, the up thrust equals weight. But in this fourth instance, the object sinks. So here, of course, the object sinks in what? That is because if you take the up thrust and weight of the object, up thrust is less than the weight of the object. So there is a resultant force downwards. Force because the weight is more, there is a resultant force downwards. That is why the object goes down and when it is resting on the surface of the container, surface of the container exerts a reaction. That is why it is in equilibrium. So the weight is equal to both the up thrust and the reaction exerted by the surface. So when the weight is greater than up thrust, the object will sink in water. So here it sinks in water. If the Weight is equal to up thrust, it will always, always float in water. Or when an object flows, floats in water completely on the surface or partially submerged or completely submerged, always up thrust is equal to weight. But if the object sinks in water, then of course the weight is greater than the up thrust. Is that clear, student? So now if we move on to the question, here you can see the maximum up thrust exerted by water on a certain object is less than the weight of the object. So here the instance is up thrust is less than the weight. Then what has to happen? It has to sink. 
you can remember that float on the water surface no float partially immersed in water no float fully immersed in water that also no so here you can see float on the surface of water flows partially immersed in water floats completely immersed in water all that up thrust equals weight so then sink fully in water that is correct so the answer is sink fully in water do you all understand that concept so that is the answer for the 27th question now with that students i'm going to end this chapter and in the next chapter i will discuss the rest of the questions in paper 1 to watch these important lessons, subscribe to DP Education's YouTube channel right now. Click on the bell icon to stay updated on the latest lessons. Sri Lanka's largest free online school, DP Education.